I wish to thank the Discovery Institute, that's the hub of the intelligent design movement, for their replies to the video titled Challenging the Discovery Institute to Discover. As you may be aware, the video drew considerable attention and is currently the number three top-rated video of all time in the category of science and technology. I should briefly note here that the Discover Institute and related folks such as Illustria Media have formed for taking down videos with false DMCAs. If you want to play this game, Discover Institute, I suggest that you first watch the videos The Discover Institute vs. Copyright and, of course, Venom Fang X apologizes to the internets. One of their replies came directly from the Discover Institute from Casey Lutchkins and has subsequently just earned him the honour of being the topic of Why Do People Laugh at Creationists Part 30. The second came from the Uncommon Descent blog founded by Discovery Institute fellow William Dembski, who still frequently posts there. The reply, actually titled PZ Myers Throws Down the Gauntlet to Intelligent Design, was referring to the video getting featured on the well-known science blog of PZ Myers. To summarise the original video, the Discovery Institute was invited to present a single gene out of the billions of base pairs that have been sequenced in maybe 180 genomes that did not display signs of an evolutionary origin as a mechanism for supporting intelligent design. Your Uncommon Descent blog reply, which I've linked in the sidebar, I will summarise for brevity. It states that our video stumbled into what Philip Johnson called Bearer's Blunder. What is Bearer's Blunder? Well, it's basically Philip Johnson, quote mining and straw manning, a basic evolution versus creationism book. Yeah, I know, that's an awfully funny way of putting forward an argument for intelligent design. The quote mine reads, If you compare a 1953 and a 1954 Corvette side by side, then a 1954 and a 1955 model and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. This is what paleontologists do with fossils, and the evidence is so solid and comprehensive that it cannot be denied by reasonable people. The blog then cites Philip Johnson's book. Of course, every one of those Corvettes was designed by engineers. The Corvette sequence, like the sequence of Beethoven's symphonies to the opinions of the United States Supreme Court, does not illustrate naturalistic evolution at all. It illustrates how intelligent designers will typically achieve their purposes by adding variations to a basic design plan. Above all, such sequences have no tendency whatever to support the claim that there is no need for a creator, since blind natural forces can do the creating. On the contrary, and I should state this is the important bit, they show that what biologists present as proof of evolution or common ancestry is just as likely to be evidence of a common design. That's from Philip Johnson defeating Darwinism by Opening Minds 97. Hmm. So what do you reckon the best way to respond to a quote mind straw man is? Well, first of all, I would like to say fantastic, Dembski, and I truly want to thank the Discovery Institute fellow. The blog you founded has just made an invaluable contribution. The quoting of Philip Johnson was priceless. Who is Philip Johnson? He is considered the father of the intelligent design movement, which rejects the theory of evolution and promotes intelligent design as an alternative. Johnson also denies that HIV is the sole cause of AIDS. I think we can safely assume that this is the absolute best that the Discovery Institute and the intelligent design community have to offer. Regrettably, the same design, same designer argument put forward by the father of intelligent design is also a staple mantra of the young earth creationists such as the convicted fraudster Kent Hovind. You know, chimpanzees and humans both have two eyes and both have right. similar color hair and both chew with their mouth open. So what does that prove? Well, it doesn't prove anything, but it no, can't, it can't a... well, it could be interpreted as common ancestor or it could be interpreted as common designer. Well, why do all motorcycles made by Suzuki, Honda, and everybody else have two wheels and all cars have four wheels? It's a, it's a common design. Well, if I notice, uh, there's eight or ten different types of bridges in the world. There's the truss type, the suspension type. Right. The, okay. I notice all of them have similar uh, construction designs. They, they all start with a foundation. Right. Wow. That proves they're all evolving from spider webs. No, it has nothing to do with That's evolution. That's my point. Because these things, no, because a bridge is a whole...
horrible analogy to a living thing. Exactly, and they reproduce, which is one of the fundamental tenets of evolution. I mean, a thing can't evolve unless it reproduces. Here we're talking about reproducing systems. Okay, but my now, point explain is... to me what this has to do with the common designer, because I really don't get it. Hmm, Johnson, I'm beginning to think you might have a point with this same argument, same origin line of thought. But let's see why this same design, same designer argument falls short in biological systems. We know that reproducing organisms pass on DNA with modification. It is a central tenant of biological reproduction, and it is the reason why paternity testing works. But how would the Discovery Institute view this? Well, first of all, they would use their Corvette analogy to suggest that a common design implies a common designer. After all, it is known that the Corvette design evolves due to designers' modifications. They would then suggest that this can be applied to biological systems and infer that shared genetic sequences between offspring and parents, you know, the sort of thing that is used for paternity testing, and I quote, is just as likely to be evidence for common design as it is to be evidence for you being the naturalistic offspring of your parents. The logical implication of Philip Johnson's argument is that you are just as likely to be a cut and paste by a designer with slight modification, after all that's how designers work, as you are to be the naturalistic offspring of your parents. So in summary, the Discovery Institute's actions demonstrate that they do not think that there is any merit in looking for genes with a non-evolutionary origin, presumably due to their knowledge of the predominance of homology in genetics, and despite the past words of one of your current directors. So when we find information encoded in the DNA in, a, in this four-character digital code that is, that's responsible for all the instructions in the cell, it's, an, it's a, the logical inference uh, and explanation to say that an intelligent uh, agent of some kind played a role in the origin of, that, of those living systems. Instead, you invoke the same design, same designer argument. Bravo! The Discovery Institute has apparently put forward an argument to contest the science of biological reproduction and paternity testing. Perhaps you should start advocating that we teach this controversy. Or maybe the strengths and weaknesses of this in schools too. Or perhaps you should have a campaign for the academic freedom of those who don't believe in paternity testing or get persecuted for rejecting sexual reproduction in favour of modification by designer. After all, these are the logical implications of the words of the founder of intelligent design.